I believe as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the problem that is happening today, is that there's a lot of people that have known the Lord Jesus Christ for many years and they have accepted Christ by faith. But you see, there's a responsibility in our accepting by faith Jesus Christ. There has to be a period of growing in Christ Jesus. You know that the book of Revelation is a book that, uh, that has to be studied. There was a, uh, a guy by the name of Luther that said that you should never read the book of James and the book of Revelations because they were too hard to understand. But we know that in the last days, God has given unto us to understand that there is a blessing for those that read the book of Revelation. Let's look at verse 3 of chapter 1 and read the blessing, what he says. He says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. It seems to be the theme throughout the whole book. The time is at hand. The Lord is coming. Now, he says that the people that read the book and they hear the words of the prophecy, which are two things, but then the third thing that he talks about is the practical. He says, those that keep those things which are written in the book for the time is short. So we see the blessing. Now go to chapter 22, and let's look and see at the end of the verse what it says. Chapter 22, and then the warning at the end of the chapter of 22 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 22, beginning with verse 18. I think that's what the verse is. Yeah, beginning with verse 18, notice what it says. For I testify unto every man that hear the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's a heavy, heavy warning God gives to us at the end of the book. Now, we know one thing for sure, that when a person comes to Jesus Christ, his name is written in the book of life. If you want to do some further study concerning the book of life, I think it would be good for you to study it because Moses, in the book of Exodus, when he was dealing with the children of Israel, and the children of Israel were actually striving with God and striving with Moses. Moses, you know, got uptight, but God was more uptight than Moses. And God came to Moses and he said, Moses, I'm going to destroy these people. I'm going to wipe them off of the face of the earth. And then Moses came to God and says, now look at God. Do me a favor. If you please can, don't wipe out these people. But if you can, take my name out of the book of life. Now, theologically, when you study that passage and you go through the whole Bible looking at the word, the book of life. Moses is declaring to us a theological statement, declaring unto us that once our name is in the book of life, our name can be taken out of the book of life. Now that's a real heavy issue in theology because a lot of seminaries, you know, they, they really, um, especially among the liberal theologians, they really get into this whole thing about that be, the taking out of the book of life and that it's impossible once you're saved, you know, that's it. But you'll see when we get to the seven churches that even Jesus to the seven churches, in one of the churches he says that if we are not living according to what God declares. He says that your name can be plucked out of the book of life. So it's a warning that we need to take heed to. I believe as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the problem that is happening today, is that there's a lot of people that have known the Lord Jesus Christ for many years and they have accepted Christ by faith. But you see, there's a responsibility in our accepting by faith Jesus Christ. There has to be a period of growing in Christ Jesus. You see, as believers, we need to be increasing in the knowledge of God. We must not decrease in the knowledge of God. We must increase so that we can get to know who God really is in our lives. And there's a lot of people that accept the Lord, but they never get into the Word of God. They never eat the Word of God. They never uh, take the Word of God as nutrition for their lives. And so they starve. And, and that's a, those are the type of people that backslide and people have all the time problems in the flesh because they do not know who God is and what the message is. Now... The subject of the book of Revelation is prophecy, but now a lot of people think of the book of Revelation right away. You think of the seven plagues, the seven trumpets, the Antichrist, the false prophet, uh, you know, Satan and all his adversaries. But the book of Revelation is the theme of the book. 
is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, to understand the purpose of the book of Revelation so you can understand it in your own heart, it is to make, to make us know that we have communion with God, but also that we have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Speaks of redemption, our redemption in Jesus Christ. And it is important that as we do study the book of Revelation, the name, again, the name Revelation comes from the Greek name, which means apocalypsis. The word apocalypsis comes from our Greek word, which means this. It means the signifying a revelation was to be concealed or a hidden thing. Now, remember when you went to see Rocky, <laughs> Rocky too. And remember they built this big old statue of him in Philadelphia and it was, on, it was actually covered and they give the big speech and then the mayor pulled the cover and here it is, you know, a big old statue of Rocky. That's the word revelation and unveiling, something that is unveiled, something that was hidden but now is revealed and uncovering. And what John is going to do, John is going to uncover for us what will take place in these last days. The book of Revelation is happening right now. In prophecy. So it's a perfect time to study the book of Revelation after the book of Daniel. Because things that are going on in your local newspapers and local TV stations and across the country are things that we are going to be seeing in the book of Revelation. In a time period, when you look at the book of Revelation as a time period, right now, the book of Revelation in church history, we are in chapter 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, which is the church age. Chapter 2 and 3 speaks to us of the seven churches. And we'll do a message on the seven churches as we get along. But there's a message for every person in the body of Christ through the seven churches. God declaring what kind of a church you belong to. And we'll learn a lot about what kind of church this church is. And what kind of churches surround us. It is important because when you think of the book of Revelation, you have to understand one thing. It was written by John the Beloved. Now, John the Beloved, so you don't get him mixed up with any other John. John is the one that, that was actually the one that was leaning on the breast of, G of Jesus. Remember in the Supper of the Lamb, when they were having supper, that uh, John, the real beloved brother of Andrew, was leaning against the breast of Jesus. He's the one that gave us the Gospel of John. He gave us the book of Revelation. He gave us 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He wrote five books to us. Now, it's important that you understand that because John the Beloved here is about 95 to 98 years old. Now, something interesting about John, he is the only one that has survived persecution. Up to this point, every one of the disciples already has been put to death. Uh, the emperor that was ruling over John at that time was Domitian, and he was actually a great persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ. And, and Eusebius, one of the great historians in Origen, and others tell us that at one point, John the Beloved was taken, before taken to the island of Patmos there in the Mediterranean Sea, he was taken and placed in a great big pot of oil that was boiling. And they took John and they put him into the pot of oil. And as it was boiling, nothing happened to John. And they got mad. They took him out of the pot of oil. And this is in history. They took him out because God had more things to share with him. And they took him and they put him on a ship and they dropped him off there in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean Sea, and they put him there for the rest of his life, and this is where God came to him at 90 years old, 98 years old, and God gave him the revelation of Jesus Christ, and God took him from 90 AD, took him all the way to the year 2000, and showed him everything that would take place. John saw the whole 2000 years of history. Now think if you were John, if God took you from the time when there's no... Uh, computers, no uh, modern technology like satellite TV. Uh, think of uh, these uh, helicopters that the Russians have, you know, that look like demons. <laughs> I mean, think about it. When John describes a helicopter, or he describes uh, nuclear weapons, or he describes something like this, if you were to write right now for the next 2,000 years, how would you describe the things that you would see? John was shocked when he saw them. But he wrote them down to his best of knowledge. And, and when he describes these, these demons, he describes them as having heads like lions, teeth like lions. He says, and they have tails like scorpions. And they go around and they sting people for five months. I mean, how would you write something like that? I mean, if you look at a Huey, 
You could actually be describing a Huey in that time as John describes these, these demons, but these are literal demons. Now, we're not going to get into too much symbolism, but we're going to see exactly what the Word of God says. Because I don't want to add to it. I read the blessing and the cursing, so I don't want to get, you know, <laughs> dabble with it. So we don't want to go too far, you know, out there and start making up all kinds of things. But I think that it is important that we understand that, that the key chapter to chapter 1 is, and to the whole book is chapter 1, verse 19. Let's look at it and see what he says. This is the key to the book. He says in verse 19, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be after these things. Do you see? If you have an old King James Bible, or if you have a new King James Bible, the word here after in the, in the Greek word is metatauta. Metatauta in the Greek language means after these things. What things? Well, first of all, he says, write the things which thou hast seen. Notice, the things that you saw. What? Chapter 1, the introduction to the book. Secondly, the things which are, chapter 2 and 3, the churches. And then, notice, the things which shall be after these things. And that's from chapter 4 to chapter 22 of the book of Revelation. So the book is divided into three sections. Chapter 1, chapter 2 and 3, and then chapter 4 through chapter 22, which we see in the, in the, in the gospel and here in the epistle to the, to the book of Revelations by the disciple of Jesus Christ, John the Beloved. Now... The key word that is used in the book of Revelation, and you need, to, you need to write these words because they're important. The word that it gives to us as believers is the word overcomer. Now, think of what he's saying, and let's, let's kind of look, we'll, we'll do an overview of the book right now as we're going through our introduction. And let's look at a verse, a chapter 2, verse 7, and see what he says about overcoming. Chapter 2, verse 7. This is the first church of Ephesus. He says, He that had an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the middle of the paradise of God. Notice that in every church, in every church, there are those that are overcomers in the kingdom of God. Those that are never defeated or those that have problems and trials in life, but they are truly faithful and obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're constantly overcoming, looking for their reward. The word overcomer is a very important word for us as a church. You see, if we were to read the scriptures today and you were to do a survey among people, you would actually write this, that people are not overcoming, but people are already defeated. There are so many people defeated today in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the reason there are so many problems in the church today among believers. So we see it seven times. We also see it in verse 11 of chapter 2. Notice. He says this in chapter 2, verse 11. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt by the second death. So the first blessing to those that are overcomers to the church of Ephesus is that they're going to be able to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden of God. The second blessing is that you will be spared of the second death. What is the second death? The lake of fire. Where Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, everyone in hell and death and hell itself will be cast into the lake of fire where all the demons and Satan himself forever and ever and ever and ever, the second death. You will be not at the second death because you're an overcomer. These are the benefits of overcoming. The third overcoming, we see it in verse 17 of chapter 2. Speaking to the third church. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. And notice, and I will give him a white stone, and a stone with a new name written, which no man knows, only he which receives the name. Isn't that interesting? We're going to receive new names. And, and it's going to be neat because the third blessing to those that are overcomers is first of all, you'll be eating from the tree of life in the midst of the garden. Secondly, you will be spared from second death. And the third thing is you're going to receive a brand new name in the kingdom of God. God will give to you if you're an overcomer. Fourth thing, verse 26 of chapter 2. And he that overcometh and keeps my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations of the world, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and the vessels of a potter, 
that shall be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Notice that. All you're doing is you're getting blessed by overcoming. God blesses people that overcome in this life. The next one we see it in chapter 3, verse 5. Speaking to the church of Sardis. Notice. He that overcometh to the same shall be clothed with a white raiment, and I will not, listen, here it is, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Notice again, here it is. The same thing I told you about Exodus Moses, about taking the name out of the book of life. When you go home, if you have a strong concordance, look up the word book of life and go all the way through the Bible and you'll blow your mind. You'll get totally blessed when you look up the study of the book of life, totally. Here in chapter 3, he's declaring that if we are not overcomers, then our name will not be taken out of the book of life. But if we don't overcome, our name can be taken out of the book of life. You see? In its context when you read it. So the blessing is there, and I love that. Another thing that we see is in chapter 3, verse 12. Notice what he says to overcomers. Him that overcometh, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Notice how many times he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, let me stop here for one second because this is important. The exhortation is to do what? The exhortation is to have an ear that is spiritual, not a carnal ear. You cannot hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches if you're walking in the flesh. The only way you as a believer in the kingdom of God can understand the book of Revelation and understand what is going on in the world today, he says, is to be overcoming how? By walking in the Spirit. Then the Spirit of God can speak to your heart and to your life and the Holy Spirit can direct your life. That's why seven times he tells you, hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. And who's the church? We are. Those that have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, not Calvary Chapel. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand that. Notice the last blessing here. Verse 21 of chapter 3. And this is the worst church of all. And we'll get to that in, a, in, in next week. Or in, a couple, in two weeks. Notice what he says in verse 21. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame, and I am sitting down with my father in his throne... He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, at this point of chapter 3, verse 22, at this point in chapter 4, verse 1, the church of Jesus Christ is raptured out. The church is no longer on the earth. So when we get to chapter 4, and we do chapter 4 and 5, this is the last time you will ever, ever see or hear or see the church of Jesus Christ. The last time you see the church on the earth is there in verse 22 of chapter 3. Never again do you see the church on earth again. The next time you see the church in chapter 4 and 5, you see the church in heaven. And in chapter 6 through chapter 18, the church is no longer on the earth. The church is in heaven. And what you see from chapter 6 to chapter 19 are those people that were left behind after the rapture of the church. And those are the people that are going to have to be beheaded because they have to take the mark of the beast. And there's a multitude like the sands of the sea like the world has never seen before. Did you know there's going to be more people saved during the tribulation period than there is more people being saved today? That's what the Bible says. There's going to be more people getting to heaven during the tribulation period than today in the church age. The Bible says that John said, I saw a multitude which you cannot even count like the sands of the sea coming out of the great tribulation as they were taken to heaven, as they were killed. And they said, how long, God, do we have to wait for all these people to be killed? And God said, just a little bit longer and then the end will come. Now, let me explain this so you will understand. If you are not taken at the rapture of the church with Jesus Christ to be in heaven and you're left behind, don't count, okay? Don't count of being a king and a priest in the kingdom to come. 
you will not rule with Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the only people that will be able to rule in the millennial kingdom when Jesus Christ comes again are going to be those that are taken with the church out at the rapture of the church because they believe by faith and they were overcomers. The only reason people will be killed in the tribulation period and will not accept the, the number of the B666 is because they will see that what their friends told them and their families told them was true. The Antichrist will be reigning and ruling and he'll be killing people. Now, if you are killed for Jesus Christ and you don't take the mark of the beast and you're killed, you're beheaded, and then you get to heaven, the only thing you're going to be doing is you're going to be reigning over the throne of God. That's all you will do is praise God over his throne, but you will not be a king and a priest. Because the Bible says too much is given, much more is required. And we're going to study that when we get to that. That's why it's important for you to understand. Many people say, well, I'll just wait till the tribulation period comes and then I'll be saved. Hey, let me tell you something. I want to go with the church. I want to reign. I mean, it's okay to be in the choir of heaven and, you know, praise the Lord, but I want to reign too. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not knocking that at all. You know, but I want to reign with Christ. I want to come back at the thousand year period, man, and I want to be a king and a priest over cities. God will give you over cities to rule over. You'll have your heavenly body, man. You don't have to use 747s to go anywhere. <laughs> you want to go, you just go. Think about that. And so it's important that you become an overcomer to those things that John talks about here. Now, when you think of the book of Revelation, and, and, and we have these things that he uses because they're important. When you think of names and titles that are used in the book of Revelation, 35 times Christ has names and titles. 35 times. Let me kind of give you the verses. I don't want to read them all because it'll take us all night. But let me give you the title and the verse and you can write it down and then you can look it up for yourself. Okay, 35 titles. The first name that we find in the book of Revelation as a title or as a name for Jesus Christ is the name Jesus Christ, Revelation 1.1. Jesus Christ. Jesus is not his first name. His name, Jesus, means Jehoshua, God is salvation, and Christ is the Messiah or the anointed one. Second title we find is Faithful and True Witness. Chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 3, verse 14. Speaking of Jesus Christ. The third name and title is the first begotten of the dead. Chapter 1, verse 5. You can just mark the scriptures and then you can look up that. Fourthly, we have the title Prince or Ruler of Kings of the Earth. Chapter 1, verse 5. Fifthly, our sin cleanser. Chapter 1, verse 5. Also, 6, Alpha and Omega, which Alpha is the first letter to the Greek alphabet and Omega is the last letter like A to Z. He's the first, he's the last. Alpha and Omega, chapter 1, verse 8 and chapter 21, verse 6. The next title we find is Lord Curias, chapter 1, verse 8, and chapter 11, verse 8, speaking of his lordship. And then eighth, we find the title or the name, the Almighty, El Shaddai, in the Hebrew, chapter 1, verse 8, speaking of his power. And nine, we find the Son of Men, speaking of his humanity, chapter 1, verse 13, and his power as the Son of Men. Ten, we find first and last, speaking that he's the first and the last. He doesn't have no beginning, he has no ending. Chapter 1, verse 17, and chapter 2, verse 8. 11, the living Christ, chapter 1, verse 18. 12, the Son of God, chapter 2, verse 18. 13, holy and true one, chapter 3, verse 7. 14, the Amen, or the Soviet, chapter 3, verse 14. The beginning of the creation, 15, chapter 3, verse 14. 16, creator, chapter 4, verse 11. 17, lion of the tribe of Judah, chapter 5, verse 5. 18, root of the offspring of David, chapter 5, verse 5. 19, lamb, speaking of his title, chapter 5, verse 6. 30 times the name Lamb is mentioned in the book of Revelations. 20, eternal reigning Christ, chapter 11, verse 15. 21, men, child, speaking of his humanity, 
in the book of Revelations, chapter 12, verse 10. 22, ruler of the nations, chapter 12, verse 5. 23, Messiah or Christ or anointed one, chapter 12, verse 10. 24, just the name Jesus, chapter 14, verse 12. 25, Lord of Lords, chapter 17, verse 14, and chapter 19, verse 16. 26, King of Kings, chapter 17, verse 14, and chapter 19, verse 16. 27, Spirit of Prophecy, chapter 19, verse 13. 28, The Word of God, chapter 19, verse 13. 29, Light of New Jerusalem, 21, 23. That's Revelations 21, 23. 30, the Rewarder, chapter 22, verse 12. And then, cha and then 31 is the Bright and Morning Star, chapter 22, verse 16. And I like this title, 32 is the Water of Life, chapter 22, verse 17. And then 33, our soon coming Savior, chapter 22, verse 20. 34, the Lord Jesus, the last one was Jesus Lord, now it's Lord Jesus, chapter 22, verse 20. And then lastly, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, chapter 22, verse 21. Now, we also find in the book of Revelation, uh, six titles of God, and these are important in the book of Revelation, so you don't get them crossed with Jesus. The names and titles of God. The first title is Father, chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 14, verse 1. Secondly, Lord God Almighty, chapter 4, verse 8, and 16, 14. Thirdly, Living God, chapter 7, verse 2. And then fourthly, God of Heaven, chapter 11, verse 13. Fifthly, Lord, not Kurias, but Jehovah, chapter 11, verse 15, and 18, 8. And then lastly, King of the Saints, chapter 15, verse 3. The book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing that is to be read and is to be kept. I read to you chapter 1, verse 3. It has 22 chapters, 404 verses, and 12,000 words in the book of Revelation. If you want that information, you can write it down. If not, it's, it's okay. You don't have to. Okay. I just thought I'd throw that out for you. Now, after that introduction, let's get into the book. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I hate introductions. Well, you need them. Let's read down and see what he says now. Let's look at the introduction, verses 1 to 3, what the book of Revelation is all about. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must surely come to pass. Notice what he says. Right at the beginning of the book, when he speaks of the revelation of Jesus Christ, he is warning you that the time is short. The end of the world is going to come, even the time of John the Beloved. And he says, the time is short. And this is the reason that you have to give the message from the angel to the messenger to John and then to the church so that we can have the receiving. We are the recipients to the message. Notice. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John who bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Twice in three verses he's warning you about the coming of the Lord. Twice. In the, you know, in the subjects of the Bible, the subject of faith, the next subject that is greater than faith is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's important that we put a, a preeminency upon the second coming of Jesus Christ. We need to be looking for the Lord's coming. You know, during the time of the hippies, and I want to share this because I think this will fall in place tonight in the book of Revelation. I remember in 1972 when I came to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Chuck was going through the book of Revelation prior to that, and, and people really got excited. From 1960, about 1969 through 1975, I mean, people were really excited about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There used to be prophecy almost on every night in every service. There was a lot of talk about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happened is that a lot of people, a lot of these hippies in those days, quit their jobs. And they gave up everything they had and they waited for the coming of the Lord and the Lord never came. Now, a lot of these hippies, which I have met and spoken to, 
have become bitter to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the church of Jesus Christ because the Lord didn't come. First of all, when Chuck was teaching the book of Revelation, he never, ever, ever told anyone to quit their jobs. Because the scripture says that even if the Lord is coming, we should continue daily in business until the Lord comes. And if He comes, He'll take us out of our business. We don't have to quit. Because when the Lord comes, it's going to come as a, what? As a, as a twinkle in an eye, and we're going to be gone, Jack. Life's like that. <laughs> you may be working as a apprentice somewhere else. Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine the day when the Lord comes? I mean, think about it if the Lord came tonight. I wonder how many would be left and how many would be taken. I mean, think of, I mean, wouldn't that be a shock? All of a sudden, you know, doo -doo -doo -doo, the trumpet blows and we're gone. And then you go, wow, man, what am I doing here? Can't go. You're left. I mean, but then that's a mystery. And I remember, I, get, I say, man, I used to go, oh, man, you know, the Lord's coming back. And I, I was always going outside looking for the Lord to come, you know. And the Lord never came. But you know what happened? People became callous, and people started getting into false doctrines, and people fell away from the Lord because they lost hope on the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know when you read Jesus, his, when Jesus writes in the Gospels, and you read Paul's epistles, and you go through Peter's epistles, and James' epistles, and Jude's epistles, and all the way to the book of Revelation, every one of them tells you about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them tells you to be watching out. We are never to lose hope on Jesus Christ's coming. You see, I believe that here when John is declaring in verse 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him to show to these servants the things which must surely come to pass. Listen. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. I believe when he speaks about the time is at hand, I think that he's saying there to us that the time is short, which means this what? That our time upon this earth is short and we can be with the Lord any time when we die. Think about it in terms like that. Now the reason I say this is because the word short in the Greek language is used seven times in the New Testament. Seven times. And the word in its context is used as a word of quickness. He says, behold, the time is short. And the word short means quickly. The Lord is coming quickly. He's going to be quick about what he's doing. Now, when you think of prophecy, and man, I wish I had a blackboard today, but I don't have one, but I wanted to draw to you the 7,000 years of dispensation. You see, the way we look at prophecy, and let me see if I can do it just without a board, and you can just kind of imagine as I picture it to you. You see, from Adam to Abraham, okay, Adam to Abraham, from the book of Genesis and Abraham, we have a period there that talks to us of 2,000 years in history. From Adam to Abraham, we believe, according to chronological order in theology, that there are there 2,000 years of history. From Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years. From Abraham to the first coming of Jesus Christ is another 2,000 years of history, which gives us a period of 4,000 years of history. That's speaking of the Old Testament. So we have Adam, Abraham, and the first coming of Jesus Christ. 4,000 years of history. From the first coming of Jesus Christ, for the 33 years that he walked upon the earth and he lived upon the earth, and then they killed him, and he resurrected on the third day, and then he was here for the post-resurrection, 40 days with the disciples, and the 120, and then he ascended to heaven, remember? From that point into the second coming of Jesus Christ, from the first coming of Jesus Christ to the second coming, biblical prophet tells there'll be 2,000 years of church history. That gives us 6,000 years of church history and gives us what? Only 1,000 years left. And what is that? The kingdom age or the 1,000 year reign of Christ. Did you know that right now we're just about to close the 6,000 year period? Right now. The period is just about to be closed. That's why I make an urgency in my life. I believe in my life that this is the last generation before Jesus Christ comes back to the earth. I believe that we are living in that generation. If we study the scriptures according to prophecy, and if we look at the book of Genesis, and Exodus, and Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and we go through 1 Samuel, and all the way through the prophets, all the way to the book of Malachi, and through the whole New Testament, we know that right now we're living in the book of Revelations, chapter 2 and chapter 3, and the church is just about to be closed. Just about to be closed. Because you know what? There's only in prophecy, in the book of Daniel, remember chapter 9, the 70th week of Daniel? There's only one week left in prophecy. 
And what is that? The 70th week of Daniel, which is what? The last seven years of world history. For who? Where God will deal with the nation of Israel, with the Antichrist and the false prophet, and the church of Jesus Christ will be taken out, and that's the seven years of hell upon the earth. Those seven years still have not been fulfilled. There's only one week left in prophecy. That means this. That from Adam to Abraham, from Abraham to the first coming of Christ, and from the first coming of Christ to the second coming, ever since the Lord left this earth, we have been children of God's grace. And according to prophecy, listen, from 560 B.C., back with Nebuchadnezzar, remember the Babylonian Empire? From the time that Israel was taken captive by the Babylonian Empire, which ruled for 70 years. And then who came? The Medio Persians. By who? By Darius and Cyrus, reigning for 200 years. And then the Grecian Empire reigned for 200 years by Alexander the Great and his four generals. And then the Grecian Empire was taken over by who? By the Roman Empire, which ruled for 1,500 years. And then what? The Roman Empire ended. And what does the Bible say? That the old Roman Empire will revive again in the last days. And did you know that right now the Roman Empire has already revived? We see it right now in Europe already. And we'll get to that in chapter 13 of Revelations. But it is important that you understand that the reason you're here tonight and the reason you have been saved has been by God's grace. You see, if you would have never been saved. Let's say that the Lord would have come back in June 10, 1967. That means you and me would have had no, not 1967, 1972 was the time of the place, of the time of the Gentiles. Now, the reason I share this is because in Romans chapter 10, he declares about the time of the Gentiles, which, uh, which Alexander the Great, Luke chapter 21 tells us, that when the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, you know that the time is near. Now, we believe in prophecy. We believe in prophecy because of Russia and because of Israel. That on May 14, 1948, this is not, not only biblical, Ezekiel 36 and 37, which only 38 and 39 are left, but we believe according to biblical prophecy and secular history that on May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation. And they went back to Palestine and they were able to dwell in their land as God had given it back to them. And God said He would do that in the book of Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. Now, once God fulfilled that, from May 14, 1948, not until June 10th, 1967, that's what it is, okay, 1967, at that point, they were, excuse me, 1969, there you go, okay, now I'm getting straight. June 10, 1969, at that point, God gave the okay for what? God gave the okay for Israel to go ahead and get the Turks out of Israel and to go ahead and take the capital city of Jerusalem, which had been under siege for how many years? 1900 years by who? By the Gentiles. Jesus said what? When the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, you know that summer is near and the Lord is going to come back. Did you know that in 1960, so 1969, June 10th, the time of the Gentiles was fulfilled and from 1969 to right now, we have been living in God's grace. Nothing is left to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. Nothing. Not even Russia to invade the Middle East. The church of Jesus Christ, according to prophecy, are living, are living by the grace of God. The next event, the next event in God's calendar, we'll see this through the book of Revelations, the next event will be the rapture of the church. And if it's not the rapture of the church, let me tell you this. You better go and study Ezekiel chapter 38 because you're going to watch the greatest battle that has ever taken place where Russia invades the Middle East. And it will be a time of nuclear fights. And we'll get to that too. You know what? I'm not trying to put a scare tactics on anybody. I'm just trying to tell you what God's word says. You can go home and you can read Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, and 39 and you will blow your mind. Because it's important that you understand that God works in perfect numbers. Remember that he says about numbers, number seven is what? The number of perfection. You see? We'll get to the seven spirits. But it's important that you understand your position in Christ, that the time is at hand, the time is short, and blessed is that man that what? That reads and keeps the word of God and what God is saying. You see, you cannot be a Christian and not keep what God says. The only way you can be blessed is by keeping what God declares in His Word. 
You know what the word blessed means? It means, oh, how happy. Here in the book of Revelation, even here in the book of Revelation, we have some blessings with the word blessed is that man. Oh, how happy that is given to us, the challenge given to us. The challenge that is given to us in the scriptures is this. The challenge of comfort in John 14, 1 to 3. He said this, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus said, I will come again to receive you unto myself. So that where I am, you may be with me also. That's the promise. I believe Jesus, then believe any liberal theologian. I believe the word of God. I believe Jesus Christ is coming for me. Now, whether I am taken at the rapture of the church, it doesn't really matter, or whether I die, I am going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ one day. And if the Lord doesn't come in this generation, that's fine with me. I still believe God's word. But you know what? I am looking up, like God said, I'm looking for my redemption. Because my redemption drew at night. I am not looking for the Antichrist. I am not looking for the false prophet. I am not looking for nuclear weapons. I am looking for Jesus. You see, way back in the 70s, it got so heavy about Jesus coming, people started storing up food. <laughs> they did. Just like the Mormons. And it's sad because what's important for you, you don't have to store up food and, and, and say, wow, man, the Lord, man, is going to leave me in great tribulation and what am I going to do? Let me tell you something. If you live for Jesus Christ, don't worry about anything else. Because the Lord's going to take you out. He's going to zap you out of here you quickly. But you know what I look at this whole thing about the time being short and the coming of the Lord is that we have to be ready when we go home, when we go to school, when we go to work because we never know when we're going to die to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. You better be looking up. The message is here. The revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The message is Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist, not the seven trumpets, not anything else in the book of Revelation, but Jesus Christ is the theme to the book. He is the key. And if you have Jesus Christ, and like he says in verse 3, if you, if, if you read it, and you hear it, and then you keep the words of God, then you have nothing to worry about. He says a lot of people that read, and they hear, but they don't do. And that's the problem. You need to hear and to read and to understand the word. If you never spend time in the word of God, you're never going to understand what God is doing in his last days. Notice now verse 4. The salutation. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now Asia, he's not speaking of all of Asia, but Asia Minor, the Roman providence. Okay, the small part of, of Asia Minor. That's what he's talking about here. He says, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before the throne of God. Now what are these seven spirits? Now, it is important first of all that you see that in verse 4, in his salutation, before he tells you about the seven spirits and before he tells you anything else, he tells you that we have grace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. Speaking of the triunity of God. Speaking of His eternity. And you know what's exciting to me? That no one can ever receive peace unless you first receive grace. Grace always, always has to be first in my life. The unmerited favor of God in my life, when I make peace with God, then the grace of God that is my life will bring peace into my life. And there's a lot of young kids and a lot of people looking for peace in the wrong places. You need to find it only in the grace of Jesus Christ. Through Him. And then he talks about the seven spirits. Notice this. And from the seven spirits which are before the throne of God. The seven spirits here is the sevenfold manifestation of the Holy Spirit work in perfection. Now you say, where do you get that from? Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2. You can read it when you go home. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 gives you the sevenfold manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is important that you understand that number seven speaks of completion or perfection. Now, let me give you a little study on numbers so you, because we're going to talk a lot, of, a lot of symbols, a lot of numerology here. One is a number of unity. Two speaks of what? Of togetherness or, two wit or a witness, the number of witness, where two or three are God in my name, there will I be. Three speaks of the Trinity of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Four is always the number of the world, the four corners of the earth. Five always is a number of grace. Six always is the number of imperfection, the number of men. Six, six, six. 
Remember, 6,000 years, imperfect, and then the 7,000 year comes, which is perfection, what? The kingdom age where Christ reigns upon the earth. Eight or seven is a number of perfection. And let me give you some things about seven. Seven is such a perfect number of completion that we have in the scriptures. Seven colors make up a perfect spectrum. Seven musical notes make up a scale. Seven days constitute of a one week. Jericho fell by the blowing of seven trumpets on the seventh day after marching seven times around the city. You see, everything symbolically. Okay. There are seven feasts uh, in the tabernacle of God. In, in Leviticus chapter 23, he speaks of seven feasts. Seven secrets of the kingdom in the parables of Jesus, Matthew 13. Seven sayings of Christ from the cross. Everything that has to do with perfection is always in sevens. And you see, God is going to fulfill his, chronologi his chronological order and prophecy from Adam to Abraham to the first coming to the second coming and to end, to, the, to when Jesus Christ ruled for a thousand years, which gives us a period of a thousand years here. $6,000, six yeah. <laughs> 6,000 years here. And then a thousand years left makes what? 7,000 year period. Okay? Now, when we get to chapter 22 of Revelations, you're going to see that at the end of 7,000 year period, what's going to happen? The Bible says this, Christ will reign for a thousand years. One more time, he'll let Satan out of the bottomless pit to go ahead and go out and deal with the people of Israel or with the whole world. And the Bible says that a multitude like the sands of the sea come with Satan against Jesus Christ after living for a thousand years in the flesh. Those are those people that came through the tribulation that never got killed and never took the mark of the beast, Jew and Gentile, and they repopulated the whole earth for a thousand years. They had babies that were a hundred years old, Isaiah tells us. Think about that. Christ will wipe them all out immediately. Okay? Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. The Bible says that hell will be open. Hell will be taken and cast into the lake of fire. Death will be cast into the lake of fire. And every person all the way back from Adam that went to hell. Okay? That went to hell or Hades or Sheol in the Old Testament will be taken out. And that's Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, which we call the white throne judgment of God. You don't want to be at the white throne judgment of God. You don't want to be at the second resurrection. You want to be in the first resurrection. Because the second resurrection will be for the ungodly, those that did not receive the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Everyone that was in hell will be let out. And they'll stand before Jesus Christ there in chapter 20. And the Bible says the books will be opened. And whoever's name was not written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. Now, a lot of people say this is the second death. You mean you die eternally? You mean there's no more feeling? There's no more uh, thinking or tasting or smelling? I mean, this is it? Total annihilation? No. Because if you read the next scripture, it says this. That their torment ascends day and night and they have no rest day or night forever and ever and ever they're tormented eternal torment the bible says now in the book of luke chapter chapter 6 chapter 16 verse 19 gives us a, gives us about a man by the name of Lazarus and a rich man which is the whole key to hell where Lazarus was a poor beggar and the rich man had everything in life he died and he was cast into hell and before Christ came before the resurrection of Jesus Christ, before he died and rose again, everyone that died went to hell, the good and the bad. In hell, there was two compartments. Okay? The righteous were higher than the unrighteous, and there was a great gulf separating. Like these two pews here, there was a great gulf separating, and the righteous were higher than the others. And the Bible says that the rich man went to hell, and in hell he looked up at the righteous, and he saw Abraham and Lazarus, and he said, Hey, Father Abraham, if you can... <laughs> Please send Lazarus that he may come from there to here and dip his finger in cool water and put it in my tongue for I am burning in this flame. So hell is not a place of party like the Rolling Stones say. You know, it's a place of torment. And then Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you had everything in life but this poor beggar had nothing. But now he is being comforted but you are being in torment. You see, notice the difference. Comfort, torment. He says, remember, what did he say? Go back and think of everything you had, everything you ever did. You see, people in hell have a conscience. They have eyes where they can see. They have a mouth where they can speak from. They can taste. They can hear. They can do anything that they have up here. And then Abraham said, hey, 
You can't come across. But then the rich man said this, but well, wait a minute. He says, I have five brothers at home. And unless they come here too, can you please do me a favor? Can you please send Lazarus to my house? Because I know that if someone would go back from the dead to my house, they would believe. You know what Abraham said? He said, son, even if someone would go back from the dead, they still would not believe. Why? Because Jesus Christ came, he died and he rose again from the dead. And look at how many people still do not believe. Think of that. Think of how many people still do not believe about the resurrection of Jesus Christ in hell. And did you know that if we right now could take a trip to hell, we would be totally, totally made sick? Because right now the Bible says that in hell, people are tormented day and night into the white throne judgment. They don't have any rest. And I know that I have relatives there. And that's what hurts me. Yeah, it hurts me as long as I am in this world. But the Bible says this, when I get to heaven, when I get to heaven, and if, if anyone in my family goes to hell, I won't be able to know that because the Bible says there's no more tears, there's no more sorrow, there's no more death. I am going to have a brand new mind in Christ Jesus, which means I'll never think back on what I did on this earth. I will be brand new in Christ. Because heaven is not a place of sorrow. Heaven is a place of joy and love. And so we need to realize that Right now is our opportunity to go ahead and tell people about Jesus Christ before it's too late. Think about it. That's my burden tonight. I think of how many young people committing suicide, how many young people are totally, totally throwing their lives away before the world. And I think of so many of you, you know, I get so excited to see you guys here so hungry for the Word of God, and yet there's so many empty churches. And there's so many, many more people tonight, right now, man, in sexual sin and, and getting drunk and getting loaded and, and doing everything else. And yet, tonight, if they don't repent, they'll end up in hell. Because the love of God goes out even to the point of death. But once you die, that's it. There's no returning back. Once you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. And you need to understand that. Don't wait till it's too late. But make sure like the presence of the Holy Spirit in the sevenfold manifestation, as we see it here, in the same way that same Holy Spirit is calling out tonight to you and saying, come unto me. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To him that overcome it, I will give you a blessing. I will give you a blessing if you come to me. But if you don't come to me, I cannot bless you. And this is the blessing that God says. Notice now what he says. Verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. The word first begotten in the Greek means first, first in order. He was the first one. He was the only one that ever resurrected first. He's the first in order in everything. He is God, okay? So you see the priority there. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins by his own blood. You know that, that phrase right there? Just totally, totally wipes my mind completely. Did you know that God loves you so much that he through his blood washed you by his blood and made you white as snow? You know what the word washer in the Greek language is? It's a beautiful word. The word means this, to, ba to take a bath, to bathe the whole person. It means to cleanse the garment exclusively for the righteousness of God. Did you know that we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and no one can ever point his finger, not even Satan, because I am not guilty? I am free. And the reason for that is because he says, not that I loved him. Notice what it says there. He says what? He, notice, he says, uh, unto him that loved us and washed us for our sins in his own blood. Let me tell you something. Who is that person that ever, ever gave his life for you? How many friends do you know that would give their life for you? What does it say? He says, he loved you. How many times I hear people say, yes, I came to Jesus Christ. I loved him. No, he loved you first. He called you. You never came to him until he called you. And you responded because he loved you from the way back from the foundations of the world, even before you were made in your mother's womb. God loved you. We need to have hearts after God's own heart. We need to forgive. We need 
to forget. We need to go out of our way and have compassion for those that have fallen out of love for Jesus Christ and try to bring them back into the love of Jesus Christ. That's what God is looking for. God is not looking for gossipers. God is looking for loving people. God is looking for people that will give their lives for other people as they gave their life for Jesus Christ as He gave His life for you.